The story picks up right where we left off, with the maniac busting out in laughter. Needless to say, the lady is gritting her teeth in frustration, and she is beyond pissed to see that this boy has the audacity to laugh right at her face. She makes it crystal clear that even if he may have escaped from the hallucinations, he should know better that he does not have absolutely anything that could turn the situation right into his favor. After hearing this, the boy lets out a faint chuckle, he then opens his eyes, and just straight up agrees to her just what she had said, and also mentions that he had just thought of a funny idea, which was the only reason he was laughing of course. It seems that this crimson clown has figured out what kind of funny idea this psychopath is talking about. Her widened eyes and tensed up face are clear signs of that. And just when she suddenly jumps out of her skin in sheer shock, it becomes painfully clear that shit is about to go down for her. The scene transitions to reveal our boy, holding on to the very book she had come out from. And the grin etching on his face clearly says that he is indeed about to do something crazy. He then recalls something about the book. According to the Yin Yang school of thought, the older a monstrosity, the higher the chances it has a vessel it resides in and is connected to. So that ultimately makes this book her vessel. And the look on her face clearly tells that it is indeed true. The boy wastes no time before biting and tearing the flesh of the book apart. While he is going all crazy, this ruby rascal could do nothing other than to watch him ripping the book off, and the blood is painting the entire panel with this gruesome crimson color. It is at this point, she starts to feel a terrifying amount of pain through her body, leaving her yelling her lungs out in agony. But my man is not one to stop, he continues to shred the skin of the book into pieces, and the look on his face clearly says that he has no plan of slowing down either. He was correct about the book being her vessel, and he is not letting this opportunity slip away. Despite being in her spiritual form, the lady is bleeding from her mouth. Regardless of her crappy situation she is in, this woman just refuses to drop her cocky attitude, and calls our boy a mortal brat. Her mind reels with the thought of how this could be possible, no one has ever been able to tamper with a monstrous key like this before. And the fact that the monstrous key of the book was the sole reason that, even the first-rate Taoist masters were only barely able to seal it away. So, it goes without saying that this brat should not have been messing around with this book as if it were just a casual thing to do. Just as the blood is spiraling around the book, indicating the severity of the situation. The lady finally goes ballistic, and goes soaring towards the boy, grabbing him by the throat and pinning him on the pillar behind. Her once cute and beautiful face turns into this creepy expression, which I clearly do not wish to see. She is asking the boy if he still thinks this is a hallucination too. This burning desire to kill the MC lingers in her eyes as she makes it clear that she no longer wants his soul. Right now, all she desires is to kill this motherfucker right then and there. But before she chokes him to death, she reminds him to blame his own foolishness for casting away the golden opportunity she had granted him before. But the boy, while clenching that piece of skin between his teeth, chuckles for a moment. And then he points out that she could have just taken this human skin book away from him, but he wonders why she is not doing something as simple as that. Let me tell you, the lady's expression turns sour once again, because the boy has finally figured out that she cannot touch this book. And the look that she has on her face just further confirms the boy's last remaining doubts. In that case, this crazy head starts swallowing the skin of the book, and this is probably the last thing this crimson clown wanted to happen. She starts choking his throat, while commanding him to spit the skin out of his mouth. She repeats her command once again, but the boy does not seem to hear what she is trying to say. The veins all over his face have started to pop out. The blood that entered his body earlier while he was ripping the book off is rampaging all throughout him, while his own blood is refluxing and coursing through his veins with rapid speed. The ruby rascal is still commanding him to spit it out, but this time her cocky commands are looking more like desperate pleas to make the boy listen. But the boy is going through his own struggles. He is feeling as if his entire body is being split with the stress, and this soul-splitting pain feels exactly like the first time he ate a toxic herb. But even though the pain is unimaginably high, what he is feeling more than the pain is the wrath of this grudgeful spirit. That is right, her grudge towards someone is as desperate as our man's, and the desire for vengeance is also the same as his. Just as the boy swallows the last remaining flesh that was hanging outside of his mouth, the lady lets out a deafening scream of frustration and failure. But the boy is still wearing the same sassy grin on his face, with the drool escaping his mouth. The lady's inner circuits finally snap, her face contorts into a horrifying expression of desperation, and she is beyond livid at this point. She wastes no time before tightening her grip on the boy's throat, causing him to cough blood like a crimson fountain on display. The crimson clown stares deep into the psychopath's eyes, while her own eyes start to shed tears of regret, failure, desperation, or any word along those lines. The look of this maniac has seared into her eyes, and I highly doubt that she will ever forget him. It seems that we are drifting into the realms of hallucinations once again, where we see our boy standing before an unknown place that has been set on fire. 
He then takes curious glances at the surroundings, only to behold a sea of crimson, where people lie lifeless with their limbs chopped off their bodies. It is not just a few dozen, but rather in the hundreds. Calling it an endless field of countless corpses would not be a stretch, because no matter where you look, it is just dead bodies, swords, and severed heads and limbs. But it seems the boy has finally found someone other than these spooky dead bodies. The scene changes, only to show us the azure ghost, sitting on her knees right before our boy. Her face and already crimson kimono are colored with this vile blood. She seems exhausted, and her face clearly tells that she is on the verge of giving up. Still, her eyes clearly say that she still has some fight left in her. So, she wastes no time before tearing a piece of cloth from her kimono and binds her hand and her sword together with this red tatter. After doing that, she raises her hand and starts to speak. But it seems the boy does not understand what she is saying, although he can see her speaking. Her face is itching with frustration, and her eyes are determined. The look on her face clearly paints a grim picture of disdain for someone, and the boy could certainly feel her profound wrath within her. She is facing someone who is sitting on their throne up on the pedestal. It seems they are male characters, or at least we are going to refer to them as male until we are told otherwise. Anyway, he has this white appearance, and his head is adorned with horn-like protrusions. There is also this spooky evil grin etching on his face, and the way he looks clearly indicates that this man is not for good. And this lady in crimson is just standing before him, tears streaming down her face. It appears as if the tears are just falling down over her eyes involuntarily. She lunges at the man before her with full throttle, and it seems she is also saying something to him, which we could not really understand. On the other side, the man is also ready to take her down, his face brimming with confidence, as if he is sure that he is the winner of this battle. He wastes no time before piercing her chest with his bare hand, leaving a gush of blood splattering all over the place. He then withdraws his hand with full force, as if he is trying to tear her innards out. And as the scene zooms out, we see him holding onto her heart, while blood is raining down from her chest like a broken tap. The poor lady is looking at her own heart thumping in the hands of this man. And this guy does not waste his breath before smashing her heart into millions of pieces, leaving the blood splattering out in every direction. After that, he throws the lady backwards from the pedestal. She crashes back on the ground with a thudding noise, leaving the blood on the floor splashing. Looks like this dude was not flying solo, because we have got a bunch of these straw hat folks, all decked out like undercover ninjas from head to toe. The whole crew of these straw hats starts marching in one direction. And now, they have got the lady surrounded from all angles. Even though the poor crimson rascal is lying there defenseless, these guys are not taking any chances, because each and every one of them has a dagger in hand. They raise their hands, and then they start jabbing those daggers into the blondie's half-dead cold body. Sadly, she is still conscious, tears are streaming down her face as these jerks keep stabbing away. The blood is just pouring out with every swing of the blade, and all she can do in her final moments is cry her heart out. Ironically enough, she does not even have her heart inside at this moment. We see the boy also walking forward, leaving ripples in the blood with each step he takes. He stood there, watching the entire horror scene happening before his eyes. After those jerks finished stabbing, all that remained was her hair and sword on the battlefield. It seems this is how this human skin book came into existence. Although we do not know exactly what happened, the scene left us just with her book, and immediately transitioned to our boy, who finally snapped back out of this hell of a ride. As the scene zooms out, we see him sitting there with the pillar's support. He is really confused as to what had happened. We can see the human skin book in his hand. We can also see this red string coming out straight out of his chest. Suddenly, we see the straw hat that our crimson clown wears falling to the ground. We also hear this familiar voice of the lady, but it seems like she is trying to speak, yet from whatever shock she is reeling with, it is just so overwhelming that the words just could not escape her mouth. The scene finally cuts to the lady, who is utterly terrified to see that she is connected to this string with our boy. But unfortunately for her, it seems she has become a loyal familiar of our boy. The boy in the background is really confused here this at first. But then, a satisfying smile spreads across his face when he realizes that he has got himself an azure ghost. We can also hear the ruby rascal grumbling in the background, refusing to believe that this has actually happened. We take another look at her terrified face, and it is clear she has started to cry as well. She turns to our boy, grabs him with her bare hands, and pins him down on the pillar, unleashing all the frustration that has been building inside her. She demands him to let her go immediately. But before she can finish her threat, she feels this sensation like her throat is being choked. Sure enough, her face tightens up, and we can see bruises forming around her neck. Without wasting a moment, she releases her grip on the boy's throat and starts coughing. Our mad crimson clown just strides out of the place, steam practically coming out of her head from frustration. And it does not take the boy long to realize that a familiar spirit feels the same pain the owner does. That is when he remembers the demonic monk, his previous spirit servant. He wonders what would have happened to him since he basically came back from the dead earlier. But most importantly he wonders where did he even go. The scene then immediately cuts to the demonic monk, who is literally crying under this shimmering moonlight outside, giving out these sad and gloomy vibes. I could not imagine how much pain he had to bear when the boy was experiencing literal hell a while ago. Anyway, he looks quite adorable while sulking. 
back to the ruby rascal. It seems she has finally made peace with her frustrated mind and accepted reality. Puffing on her smoke pipe, she mentions to the boy that they are going to be together from now on. With that in mind, she proposes the idea of taking a moment to introduce themselves. The boy takes the liberty and introduces himself as Mok Jong-woon and promptly asks about her and what he should be calling her from now on. But it seems that the lady has still not recovered from all the drama of becoming a fucking servant, so she gives Jung-woon the silent treatment. But the boy does not shy away from telling her that if she is not gonna tell him what he should call her, then he will call her whatever he wants. But the lady decides to remain silent, and the boy does not waste his breath before calling her a red dung beetle. Needless to say, this grumpy lady snaps back in frustration at our boy, asking him if he has lost all his brain cells. But Jung-woon just laughs wholeheartedly, as if he is having the time of his life. But the lady is just pissed off, seeing this bastard mocking her like that. The boy asks him why do not she just tell her name, if she really hates him calling her Dung Beetle that much. She twirls her head over into the other direction, while making it clear that she is not going to tell any stupid mortal her name. Jung-woon finds himself utterly dumbfounded at this foolish lady who refuses to give her name yet she does not want him to call anything he desires. The boy gets serious and decides to just call her whatever he wants. But this time, he is thinking of an appropriate name that suits her origin as a blue spirit. He is brainstorming names along those lines. Finally, he comes up with the idea of calling her Blue Spirit. He tells the lady once again, reminding her that this is what he is going to call her from now on. But this magenta mischief is just way too full of herself to respond to our boy. She just shrugs him off, grumbling in her arrogance. At this point, even Jung Woon knows that this lady is arrogant, and it is really going to be a pain to tame her since he cannot resort to violence or anything. But as you would expect, our boy is not an incompetent guy. He acknowledges that her grumpy behavior is understandable considering the way they got to this point. So, the best thing he can do is slowly persuade her to like him. After that, he takes a look at this human skin book laying on the ground, and we can clearly see the corner side of the book is missing his skiing that our boy had a while ago. Jung Woon is actually curious about this book and he wants answers. He curiously turns to the blue spirit, calling her by her new name, and asks if she knows anything about it. But the lady, being her usual self, asks him who this blue spirit is he is referring to. She mentions that she does not know about any blue spirit he is talking about. Then she adds that she does not know about the book either, so he better not ask any questions about it since she is busy, and she shrugs him off with her smoke pipe. The boy is sweating at this point, probably having no clue how he is going to deal with this lunatic. Anyway, he decides to investigate himself, and as soon as he opens the book, the boy is utterly astounded by its contents. It seems his shock is understandable, as the contents are written in blood within this book. However, being the psychotic maniac he is, he finds it rather fascinating to see a book bound in human leather and written in blood. I am pretty sure he is looking forward to delving into this literary odyssey, but it seems the contents of the book do not make any sense to him. The characters, in particular, are really strange, and he wonders what they are supposed to mean. Meanwhile, the lady is also observing his confused expression and cannot help but chuckle at the sight of our boy struggling to make sense of the book. Jung Woon looks back at this cunning fox, wondering how long it has been since she is looking at him. Though one thing is clear to him is that, this crimson clown does not seem to have any plans of telling him anything about this book anytime soon. But for now, the best bet is that he just figures out this mysterious book on his own. He continues to flip the pages, hoping to find any clue about anything. And it seems that the book has started to make somewhat sense to him. Out of the blue, he starts reciting some words. He begins by saying, without despair, rely on the mind of the other form. As soon as these words fall onto the lady's ears, she immediately turns around with her face totally smeared in utter shock. But the boy continues reciting, and the next line goes like, before nothingness, there must have been a form, and what seems to be may not actually be. Instantly, the blue spirit starts to feel this heavy force pinning down her feet to the ground. Her surroundings are changing, and by the looks of her face, it is clear that something big is about to happen. Almost instantly, this purple energy starts to appear in the atmosphere, surrounding the boy from every direction. But despite the change in atmosphere, the boy remains undeterred and recites yet another sentence. The demon stands in the way of the good, but the ultimate blood has the power to reverse all. As soon as these words escape his lips, the book begins to react, and a burst of light pops out in the palm of his hand. The book now looks totally wrecked, and Jung Woon is quite confused to see that the book has stuck to his hand. He then lets the cunning fox take a look at the withered leather of the book. I do not really know what is going on, but it seems the boy has messed up big time, and the blue spirit is just losing her bananas to see the book in that condition. Her face is sweating bullets, all in her bewilderment. She does not waste any time before asking what the fuck did he do. But it seems the boy is clueless as to what is happening. He asks if this has something to do with the book, which made it stick to his hand. Suddenly, something smacks the boy right into his chest, leaving him breathless for a moment, and ominous smoke starts to swirl around him. This same smoke is also swirling around the lady, and she seems quite bewildered to see something happening before her eyes that she never intended to see. She is worried that if the boy took any damage she is going to feel the full brunt as well. 
So, she immediately tells the already struggling boy to stop breathing, without wasting a single moment. Jung Woon immediately holds his breath and clenches his lips tightly, making sure that not a single ounce of air leaves his mouth. Just as he does this, the blue spirit instructs him to empty his head and tells him not to think about anything at all. The boy is fully calm now, and the veins that were popping out on his face have started to simmer down, and everything seems to be calm. The veins on his hand also start to recover, and surprisingly, the book also releases its sticky grasp from his hand. And it seems the ruby rascal is quite shocked to see that Jung Woon achieved the results without any major efforts. The book is falling down, while the last remaining purple aura also starts to disappear into thin air, and the already falling human skin book finally crashes onto the ground. We hear ruby rascal's inner thoughts once again where it is clear that she is struggling to comprehend how this dude reversed the ritual of attachment like that. The fact that he does not even know martial arts makes it next to impossible for him to do that. But then, she assures herself that it was just a miracle that he even managed to carry out the ritual of attachment. But then again, she is just saying it to herself, just because she does not seem to know what the hell just happened. Deep down, she is aware that this boy is extraordinary, and she is witnessing something she never did in her life before her death. After this insane experience, my man just falls straight on the stair step and lets fresh air into his lungs. He even admits that he had nearly thought he was going to suffocate to death today. That is when the lady mentions that it was because he could not control the ritual of attachment properly and his breathing was entirely wrong. The boy, with a pleasant smile, mentions how she has finally decided to open up her mug and explain to him now. The lady perhaps senses some sarcasm in his tone and lets out an annoyed grunt. But being a rosy rascal is not easy, so it does not take her long to erupt into frustration. She makes it clear that she is only telling him so she can avoid taking any damage herself because of his foolish behavior. The boy, however, still chuckling, tells her to simmer down. After that, Jung Woon asks him what this ritual of attachment exactly is. The crimson clown, still hesitating a bit, spills the beans that this ritual actually lives up to its name. Essentially, he can attract things towards himself and they stick to him. By doing so, he is bending the very essence of stuff to his whim. But Jung Woon is still curious. If this power is just about yanking stuff his way, why did his gut feel like it was tying itself in knots and his veins were popping? The lady clarifies that it is because he was pulling at thin air. In simpler terms, he manipulated the flow of his own key, but did not snag anything after the book, so naturally, things got all out of whack. She then directs his attention on the other side of the hall telling him to try his ritual on this. The scene transitions to reveal the dead body of the guard my man killed before. Jung Woon immediately grabs the man and asks if she is actually talking about this dead guy. Crimson Clown responds with yes and further mentions that try pulling him from his energy core. Although the guy is dead and his key is probably spread out since he is dead, the boy curiously asks what she meant about being below the belly button. But this sassy woman gives him a weird look, asking him if she has to spoon feed him everything. The boy, with his blank face, meekly says yes, to which the lady lets out a faint frustrated grunt. Now the stage is set, and the boy places his hand right below the belly button of this guard. The lady instructs him to recite the chant once again. Just when he is ready, this ominous purple energy starts to flash once again. Jung Woon is totally focused at this point. His hand is placed correctly, and he is reciting the chant in his mind, which of course I am not going to narrate to save your time. Just as his enchantment hits the last verse, the purple energy starts to intensify. Jung Woon immediately feels something going on under his hand, and whatever he is feeling seems to be quite fascinating. It is at this point we learn that the warmth is traveling through his veins directly into his palm, circling around his own energy core. While the lady is puffing out puffs of smoke, she tells him to pull forth anything and make it stick, even if that thing he is trying to pull is the key itself. With the satisfying look of a master who helped his disciple score full marks, she asks Jung Woon if this is working. And the look on the boy's face is all the confirmation we needed. He is finally feeling the ritual of attachment firsthand, which is a hell of an experience in itself for him. I think we are ending this video here. The story is actually picking up, and our boy has finally picked up some fancy moves as well. I'm really eager to see how he's going to spank his second elder brother's ass with his newfound powers, because I'm pretty sure his brother will not let him off the hook easily, especially since he has already killed one of his loyal guards. Needless to say, you'll have to stay tuned for the next one to find out. With that said, leave a like on this video, and I'll catch you guys very soon. Until next time.